Hello. Good morning. Welcome back to Why It's Not in the Bible with Kaloran and Taylor. Yes. So we are back here again this week um, with the book of Enoch. Um, and we're doing part one today because it's a little, it's a little, it's a little intense. So we're going to break it up into bite-sized chunks um, to help us and to help you guys. We're moving. So in the grand, like, craziness of what's going on in my life right now of my 12 hour days of school and work and then moving we decided to read one of the craziest apocryphal books that we could have ever read so if really my insights up. are a little shallow or my background seems a little boring please give me grace because i would do the same to you <laughs> just love me through it y'all love me through it this is a very strange book um it is also one of many books of Enoch's. There is the Book of Enoch, another one that's called the Book of Enoch, there's the Secrets of Enoch, and really none of them are related to each other. Like, they don't share an author, they don't even seem to acknowledge that each other exists by and large. And so what people did with this is they just named them First Enoch, Second Enoch, and Third Enoch, even though they're not a trilogy or anything are really related to one another but it's just like i don't know this is the first enoch book we found this is the second enoch book we found this is the it third was kind of half-hearted when you think about it like, right so we're doing first enoch and first enoch is like 120 chapters or something like that so we, that would have taken us like three weeks then a 45 minute video no one wants that so we broke it into manageable chunks here so we're just going to try and take you to the first bit which is chapters 1 through 36 which is also known as the book of the watchers it reminds me of like a genesis revelation hybrid of purely heretical things of a guy that really kind of maybe got jealous of john the one who had the book of Re revelation um of the like apocalypse and end times and it kind of seems like he got a little jelly. So he was like, well, I can see visions too. And was like writing down all this random crap. And no offense to you if you like believe in the book of Enoch. But like, I don't know if this dude knew God or not. Because it's a little weird. So we're going to kind of wade through it. But basically, yep. that was my first opinion when reading this book. I was like, there's a tree of knowledge. And now there's a throne and God sitting at like what is going on? But yeah. this is this is probably the the first apocryphal book that we've hit that does feel like it could have been written on acid. Like that is... <laughs> Thankfully the author is like long gone, but yeah. I mean, As we just, like, tear him to shreds on it. I try to have <laughs> By the way, to, like, probably not actually Enoch who wrote the book, just to exactly. spoil it off. Like, where did you get the name Enoch? Anyway, but I feel like I always want to have grace with people that, like, oh, this is maybe why somebody would believe in this book. But, like, this is one of those times when I'm like, no, bro, like, no. So let's let, – let me try and walk through for people because – you're, you're also blessed out there. You didn't have to read this. So let me try and walk you through the narrative of First Enoch here. So I took notes because there's a lot happening here. So first off, opening act here. 200 angels who are also known as the Watchers of Heaven uh, go down to Earth, have sex with women, give birth to giants, and then teach them herbal witchcraft. That is inciting incident to begin the book. At which point I was like, rechecking the link. Am I reading the right book? Did Taylor send me the right thing? So I was like, like, it's kind of like hide your kids, hide your wives. The angels of heaven are coming down. They're yeah. going to you. The, the, like, the framing is like, oh, they wanted to marry the women. It's, it, it is, like, it, it very much feels like rape in the text. <laughs> well, here we go. That and was also, the so there's two, different, there's two different translations of the Book of First Enoch, for what it's worth. Uh, we read the Oxford version, which translates, when it's trying to talk about how tall are these giants, which, sorry, this is a little detail, but I found it fascinating. They said 3,000 L's. 3,000 L's is 11,000 feet. And the giants are 11,000 feet tall. 
Which makes me feel a little bit more trusting of angels, though, because God says in in the Bible, in Psalm, that his angels will encamp around us and surround us. And if they're like, if the kids that are combined, like angels and humans, are 11,000 feet, that angel gene pool probably has a lot of Norway, a lot of Norwegian roots in them. We're talking maybe... 19,000 feet. Yeah, if you average that out. Average yeah, that out. exactly. It's like, well, we're no 1,000 feet, and they're 11,000. So 22,000 on the other end, if that's how this works. Just easy math. Easy math. I'm just throwing numbers out. It's um, more trusting, though. I've got there's another trusting. translation that puts them at being 300 cubits, which is 450 feet, which is still very tall and giant but is different than 11,000 feet. Very different. The the guy really leading the charge on this front is a guy named Azazel. He's an angel. He's a Points watcher. Points name. Uh, now, here's the thing. These giants, what do they eat? Well, at first they start by eating all the people's food. And then the people run out of food. So the giants eat the people. And, uh, Predictable. and this, is a, this is where God gets pretty angry. And they're very graphic in the text about how they eat the people and drink all the blood up and like things like that, which is just like, okay. So God is mad, and this is why he plans to destroy the earth and flood it. And so he sends off an angel off to the side. He's like, quick, go tell Noah that this is happening. So it's like, ah, this is the behind-the-scenes machinations here. <laughs> it's all these giants running around. That <laughs> That's why we had to... <laughs> that's why we got flooded. Okay. God's like, this was never meant to happen. The, the earth is, I did not build the earth for 11,000 foot tall people. So, bad. <laughs> so. But, like, don't you have a lock on heaven or something? Like, why'd the angels get out? They're like, <laughs> let's invade the earth. Oh, no, I forgot to close the gate today. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me so, like, concerned. Like, I when we were kids, like, I left the gerbils door open and we had gerbils roaming around (laughs) those gerbils didn't even wait a couple of seconds to get out of that cage so like i'm thinking angels just like left the garage door open or something (laughs) like the gerbils when you let them out of the cage they cannot wait to run off and start getting busy (laughs) it's true though Wow, good analogy but we carry on so (laughs) this is at this point where they're like by the way Remember back early in Genesis how Enoch never died, just got taken up to heaven? Well, Enoch's just been chilling up in heaven. And it is at this point that God's like, Enoch, I got a special mission for you. You're going back down to earth. Yeah. Like, he's like, what do I do? And he's can like, you do that? I want you to go tell the watchers who are living down there, all those bad angels, they are doomed. <laughs> like, that is... Big surprise. And so, and so, uh... It's basically it's basically a scenario kind of like Enoch is supposed to be Jonah for the fallen angels, uh, where the fallen angels are Nineveh, except there is no chance of redemption. They are just actually doomed. Which um, does kind of seem backwards, right? That like God would send a human that's already this died. This is to me, I think, one of the biggest to save the an- like. I think this is one of the biggest failings of the book is that we see God as a God without any compassion or forgiveness. Is yeah. that the, the wrath ang- angle is correct, but there's no sense of uh, when an Enoch gets down there, he tells the Watchers, and they ask for forgiveness and 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 are repentant, and God says no in a dream oh. to Enoch, and that's uh, that. I mean, maybe it's different for angels, but that does feel inconsistent with like the large picture of God. What? I'm sorry. I love the comment. I love the quote. Maybe it's different for angels. Like, <laughs> what? Like, well, I don't okay. know what angel salvation is. I'm sure we'll get into that in part three of the book of First Enoch. Because this is like the most angel dump that we've ever gotten. What happens next is that the giant children, according to the dream that Enoch gets from God, will become evil spirits that haunt the earth. I don't know if they're saying that the dead giants are demons 
and that's where we get them from? Or what? You can go to First Enoch 15 if you want clarification on that. I'm confused about what it meant. Was that what you got? Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't really know. It just seemed bad from the get-go, but it seemed to get very bad when God's like, okay, this group's going to be evil. This guy's going to come back from heaven. We're having a flood. I was like, oh, no, Earth. This is going to get bad. This is going to get really messy. Yeah, God's angry with you. So then we start going. Then that's it pretty much for the Watchers. And Enoch is going to go. Like, I guess they're just doomed. And so then Enoch goes on, like, a weird sightseeing tour of heaven and hell in the afterlife at this point. Yeah. And at this point... I start completely losing the thread of the book and and what we're doing here on it, but we That's still the have part that I understood. And we still have about eighteen, nineteen chapters left of the Book of the Watchers at this point. We are halfway through. This book covers a lot of ground and does not clarify very much. So then we get to he gets to chapter eighteen. He sees. I think it's supposed to be hell. It's really unclear. They don't use the word hell at any point here. But he's describing a place where there is fire that burns forever. And maybe in the same place or maybe in a different place, a place where there is no sky, no ground, no water, where you are trapped forever in the final moment of planet Earth, kept in stasis until Judgment Day. But then there's another thing, which and it's like, well, the angels, the angels are there. All the fallen watchers go there. Evil angels are going to purgatory. Yes. There's a hell. And then he also sees, does he not see heaven? He does. But first we also get to this weird other thing, which is where there's like a bunch of mountains where there's hollowed out crevices and, like, the souls of people are in the crevices. And it seems like, oh, is this hell? But then it's like, the soul of Abel, who Cain killed, is here. And this is where he sits interceding that God will ruin Cain's family tree. Um, but then there's other crevices where it's like, these are the people who are evil. So it kind of just seems like everyone goes there who's a person and just kind of asks God for stuff for an unknown amount of time before Judgment Day. So the part... Or like it's souls with unfinished business. It's really unclear. Like I read this section like four times to try and figure out like what are, what is the grouping here? And, and it kind of seems like there's a lot of groupings. They're like, there's four crevices. But then it kind of seems like there's more. But they're like, there's four crevices, and maybe it's three for the bad people and one for the good people. But it doesn't seem like there's more than one soul in each crevice. So it's, it's very weird, this whole section. So weird. I thought the part that was really interesting, but extremely heretical, was <laughs> the next part when they when um, when he finds himself like in a forest and he finds the throne of God. And I was like... Yes, so we're going to get like, to that. Because we were definitely still on Earth, but he found, like, accidentally found God's throne. So what they're doing there is there's, like, there's seven literal mountains. So anyone who loves, like, the seven mountain prophecy, knock yourself out here. But there's seven literal mountains. And on the seventh biggest, most glorious mountain, which has, like, a really nice forest and apparently smells great, is at the very tip top of that mountain. There is the throne of God. And when Judgment Day comes, God is going to come down from heaven and sit in his throne and judge everyone there. Like, it's the most literal possible interpretation of Judgment Day. Which and it kind of seems like God's just going to chill there for the rest of time. Which, <laughs> if you've seen The Shack, which I'm actually a huge fan of the movie, uh -huh. that's actually pretty, like, that's pretty much how they depicted Judgment Day. It was like... Behind a waterfall, on a mountain, mm -hmm. in a cave, and people presented themselves before the judge. So that's 
that's pretty much it. There's a couple weird other chapters at the end where it's like, by the way, there's also portals that open from heaven to earth, and that's where wind comes from. Which is like, okay. Like, I also was reading it kind of humorously, and I was like, oh, Taylor's probably going to disagree with me that that's not actually what it meant. But I thought I found it really funny that, like, at the end of the... Um, it's not really the end of that book, but the end yeah. of the section that we were reading, the part one... It cracked me up that it was like, after everything's all said and done, these are your exits. Like, find three exits in the south, yeah. four exits in the north. Exits yeah, from the, like, from the should any angels need to leave heaven again? These are your exits. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, how hilarious. I know that's not probably what it meant. It was portals and weather and right. whatever, but I was cracking up because it just went hand in hand with the rest of the book of the ridiculous nature of yeah. it. Oh, absolutely. Um, so why is it not in the Bible? What's wrong with this book? I, I don't know. I could really see having a really good Bible study about this book. Getting into the theology about God, his character. I made a list of four points that was just, it's scientifically wrong, God's character of forgiveness is not here, it's real fan fiction about angels, and it's got strange ideas about evil spirits and sirens and the afterlife. And that reminds me, I forgot to mention the fact that apparently all the women who had sex with angels, they don't get normal afterlife treatment, they just become sirens. It doesn't explain what that means, so I assume it's the Greek mythology sirens, which is just... Okay. Here's the wild thing about this book. I know, everything else has been so normal. Um, <laughs> I thought when I started looking this up, I was like, there's no way anyone took this seriously. Like, we are giving it way more credence than it even deserves by looking at it here on, on this video series. No. This book got a lot of serious consideration and had many early church fathers backing it. So it was created 300 to 200 BCE. So about, uh, we're, we're near the end of when Old Testament books are being written at that point, but the Jews did not include it in the Tanakh, um, which is probably the thing that saved us from having to deal with this in the Bible, as you will see. Um, apparently one of the reasons was that it was very controversial at the time to say that angels rebelled against God and fell from heaven. I mean, I know that's how Satan came to be, or we believe mm -hmm. that is, but, like, it kind of felt a little weird to me, too, that, like, mm -hmm. they weren't even acting in an even godly way, like a bunch of them. I don't know. Yeah, they, like, make a pact together that's like, all right, we none of us can wimp out on this one. We're all going to go down and marry women and have sex. It's like, it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest. Like those act. two elders in, was it Susanna? Yeah, yeah, it's like that. It's like, what? I didn't know people could do that. I mean, there you have it. Yeah, so. I still want to know about angel salvation, though. <laughs> well, maybe we'll get there. Again, we still got four more installments of this. Okay, so, um, so here's the thing. Uh, when the New Testament early church got their hands on it. So, like, this would have been, like, 200 CE and earlier. Um, they said, I think this book checks out. I think the Jewish people disqualified this book because, and I guess this is maybe coming, we'll see, uh, because it has prophecies about Jesus in it. And that's what they didn't like. Not all the other stuff. But this, oh my so, gosh. So that was the argument. And it was like Clement, Tertullian, Irenaeus, some of the best early church theologians whose like names you recognize were like, yup, co-sign it, Book of Enoch, should be in the Bible. And then, but here's the wild thing. Then there was like a 180 degree flip then within a very short span of time after it. So that when you get to like toward the end of the early church time frame, so maybe like we're getting close to like Constantine-ish sort of era, um, everyone says, no, this is not a Bible book. This is not canonical. To the point where, now here's where it gets weird. The book of Jude, which is in the Bible, Jude 1, 14 through 15, seems to quote 1 Enoch 1, 9. So the Bible does quote Enoch, 
which I think led some of the early church to be like, oh, maybe this checks out. But I then, but then it's interesting that almost gets Jude disqualified from being in the Bible by the oh. time the later church is like trying to come up with the, like the official Deutero canon, and they're like. Oh, maybe Jude is bad. <laughs> like it's like Wow. So it's it's really interesting like how Enoch sort of like It's like when you meet someone and you're like, Oh, they're cool, but then you see who they're dating or who they're married to and they're just like a horrible <laughs> person and you're like, Maybe maybe that person isn't so good. Right. They would be with somebody like that. Maybe I shouldn't like them either. <laughs> yeah. And so so you get all of that. There's also, like, in the Bible, there's some people who argue this. This is a lot more sketchy. Like, it's it's probably, I would say, looking at the evidence, it probably seems like 70 to maybe 80% consensus that Jude does quote from Enoch. There's maybe, like, a weird kind of, like, a ra- beating around the bush sort of explanation that you can make for why it's not. Um, but then you have, uh, like, much more sketchily, people are like, I think First Peter, Second Peter, and the book of Hebrews all also have slight references to Enoch. Wow, we'd have and, to like, take out and a lot. that's uncertain. What we do know is Enoch was definitely circulating around, and people knew about it at the time wow. of the early church. Which might also explain the references in the way that, like, maybe you would make a Star Wars reference in a sermon, but, like, you're not actually saying Star Wars is biblical theology. Like, maybe there's something to it of that. It is kind of confusing, and I'm hoping that we can dig more into this as we, like, get further on in the series. Right. But for now, we've talked enough about Enoch for this week. We will have four more episodes coming out soon, so be Come sure back. to stay subscribed. Uh, Kalorn, you want to close us out? Any final yes. thoughts on Enoch today? Come back next time to hear <laughs> all the things about angels doing ratchet things in, on Earth, mountain paradises where Jesus is apparently referred to where God sits, and anything else that these early writers just thought sounded like a good idea at the time. Yeah. We... Appreciate your guys watching our channel and mm-hmm. share our videos. They're just so unique and we understand that, but like it's a very cool process to at least I'm enjoying um making it a priority to learn something that like you would just never learn otherwise yeah. or honestly in our circle we would just never seek out to learn. So it's really cool to kind of know um about the history of our faith and also maybe some pitfalls that we could avoid today of just making stuff up on our own. So we'll see you guys later and have a good week. Thanks. Bye.